بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ يَوْمَ تَجِدُ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ مُحْضَرٍ وما عملت من سوء تود لو أن بينها وبينه أمدا بعيدا ويحذركم الله نفسه والله رؤوف بالعباد قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم والله غفور رحيم قل أطيعوا الله والرسول فإن تولوا فإن الله لا يحب الكافرين الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سلك سبيله واهتدى بهديه إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, Welcome to the third session in this series on the companions Great to see you all here today, mashallah. Before I get started, just a couple of um, quick things I need to get out of the way. The first is, um, well now there's a table here anyway, but, but previously, or obviously last time we did this, I had a bit of a rant about the kids crossing over from this side, because previous time one of the kids had pulled the, the mess up the cables. So now if, if any of the uh, younger children want to go from one side to the other, I think there's a gap at the back, so it'd be great if they go through there, nobody comes past here. Um, second thing is, I was told that last time some people didn't give their um, two pounds per person contribution. Um, so just whether that's true or not, just to remind everyone of that, it's to be put in the donation boxes. There's one here and one over there for the brothers, so uh, everyone put their two pounds in. It actually costs us more than two pounds uh, for the pizza, but I mean, we kept the minimum at two pounds, but if, if anyone wants to put in more, they're welcome to put in more. So, Abu Hurairah, um, now, now, when we talk about Abu Hurairah, um, the thing that Abu Hurairah is most, uh, most commonly associated with is Hadith. Because Abu Hurairah, he was, he was, Abu Hurairah was, uh, well, was well known to be a narrator of Hadith. And to give us some idea of this, uh, I've got this narration here. Can, can, any, can everyone read that? Can anyone read that? Yeah? yeah? Okay, so uh, Abu Hurairah, he went to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, uh, O Messenger of Allah, Man as'adu al-nasi bi shafa'atika yawm al-qiyamah Who will be the happiest with your uh, intercession on the Day of Judgment? And uh, the reason I brought this here is actually to show us what the Prophet Sallallahu said to him before, uh, before actually replying to his question. He said, I did not think anyone would ask me about this before you, Abu Hurairah, as I have noticed your eagerness to learn hadith. Um, and then, so, so it, this shows us how keen Abu Hurairah was to that hadith. Even the Prophet Sallallahu noticed that, you know, he was different from, from everyone else. And as a separate point, I just underline this part here because obviously when it says, uh, whoever says La ilaha illallah, it doesn't, it doesn't literally, it doesn't just mean, it doesn't just mean saying La ilaha illallah. Just saying La ilaha illallah is not, is not enough. Um, so, if you do that and say la ilaha illallah, that's not, um, that's not going to be... Uh, uh, so, the one who says sincerely from their heart, as I outline, sincerely from their heart, is obviously going to act on it as well. They will also be acting on it. They don't just say it. Um, so, when, when if they say there's no good about Allah, then when Allah tells them to pray, they will get up and pray. When Allah tells them to fast, they will get up and fast. When Allah tells them to do anything else, they will, they will do it. So, Abu Hurairah, to understand the story of Abu Hurairah properly, and where Abu Hurairah actually comes from, uh, we need to look at another person called Tufayl ibn Amr. Tufayl ibn Amr, he was a leader of a tribe called the Daus tribe. So in those times, in those days, everyone lived in, everyone lived in tribes. And, uh, and each tribe had a leader or leaders. So Tufayl ibn Amr was the leader of this tribe. Uh, he came to Makkah in, um, 
in the sixth year of the, of the message. He came to Mecca in the sixth year of the message uh, to perform pilgrimage. The people of Mecca warned him, don't listen to anything that, uh, that Muhammad says. Uh, because he's, you know, he's, uh, they, they said that he's like a, uh, he's got magic and stuff like that. And if you hear anything from him, you'll become possessed. So don't hear, avoid hearing anything from him. So for play, he, he, he did his best to avoid hearing anything from the Prophet ﷺ. But he happened to hear the Qur'an. And when he heard the Qur'an, he was so taken by it that he actually accepted Islam, like they had feared. So, then he went back to his own people and he started calling them to Islam. But most of them ignored him, apart from one or two here and there. Uh, and Abu Hurairah may have been one of, those, uh, one of those few. The majority of them, they ignored him and they carried on with their evil acts such as, um, such as fornication, drinking alcohol, uh, riba and so on. So he became very upset. He went back to the Prophet ﷺ and he said to him, he asked him to make dua that Allah destroys his people. Allah destroys his people because he got tired of them. He thought, you know, they're never going to become Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands and he said, Allahumma hdi dawsan. Oh Allah, guide the people. Sorry? Uh, Can you go slower? Oh, slower. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. <laughs> Sorry, what were you going to say? taking notes. Oh, okay, yeah, no. Okay. Uh, so, oh Allah, guide the people of the Dawes. No, sorry, I thought you were saying uh, it was too loud or something. I didn't, I didn't understand yet. Um, so, oh Allah, guide the people of the Dawes. So, the, the, the man had come asking the Prophet to pray for their destruction. Instead, the Prophet prayed for their guidance. And when he returned to them, uh, when he returned to them and he started calling them again, they actually accepted Islam. A huge number of them accepted Islam. But they only came to Medina in the seventh year of the Hijrah. Uh, so just so we have some idea of the, of the timeline now. So these people, they weren't actually living in Mecca or in Medina. They were living somewhere else called Al-Baha. So we can see here. Can everyone see that on the map? So near the top is Medina. At the top, down, uh, uh, further down is Mecca. And even further down, with the red arrow pointing to it, is Al-Baha. It's nearer to Yemen. So these people, the Dawes tribe, they were based, they, they, were, they lived in Al-Baha. And although, as I said, many people accepted Islam maybe in the sixth year or a bit later than that of the, of the, of the sixth year of the message, uh, they only joined the Prophet not while he was in Makkah. They only joined the Prophet later on when he was in Medina. Uh, so just so we have some idea of the, of the timeline, does anybody here know how many years the Prophet spent in Makkah as a Prophet? Yep. Four? Four? That's a bit low. Yeah. Yeah? 12. 12, yeah, I think 12 is about right. They say 12 or 13. No, no, this isn't, this isn't the quiz, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so, you spent around, around 13 years in Mecca as a prophet. And in Medina? 10. 10, yeah, 10. So when I say 6th year of the message, that's 6 years after he became a prophet, so while he was still in Mecca. Well, 7th year of the Hijra means 7 years after he migrated to Medina and a few years before he saw Allah and passed away. So, uh, so they've joined, they, they only joined, they became Muslim earlier on, but they only joined the Prophet when, once he moved to Medina and uh, towards the end of his life. So, and there's another narration pointing towards this as well, uh, which says Abu Huraira, what, it's from the Battle of Mu'tah. I mentioned the Battle of Mu'tah last time. And he says Abu Huraira, uh, so, so the Muslims had gone to fight the Romans, and they were hugely outnumbered. There was, there was, there were, the, the Romans were in uh, tens of thousands. <laughs> And um, it was the first encounter of the Muslims with the Romans as well. So Abu Huraira, he's only come to, to, uh, to Medina in the seventh year of the Hijrah. And the following year, he goes to fight in the Battle of Morta. And it's the first encounter with the Romans. So another of the companions, he noticed Abu Huraira and he said to him, Oh Abu Huraira, it appears as if you think there's a huge number of them. And Abu Huraira, he's standing there staring at thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Roman soldiers. So he said, yes, by Allah, I do think that there are a huge number of them. And the other man, he said, but you were not with us at Badr when we were outnumbered and we didn't win because of our numbers. So we were hugely outnumbered there as well, but Allah still gave us victory. So the point being, Abu Huraira, he joined much later on. Um, okay, so Abu Huraira, he was from, he, be, he became part of the Ahlul Sulfa. Now the Ahlul Sulfa, they were a group of very, uh, very poor men who didn't have, who weren't from Medina, they didn't have family in Medina, 
and they didn't have any of their own family either. So they weren't they weren't married or, or they weren't married and they didn't have children, basically. Um, oh, actually, I missed something. So Abu Huraira, uh, when he became Muslim, uh, he, when he became Muslim, his uh, his he didn't have uh, his father. His father had passed away when he was very young, so he was an orphan from a very young age. And then he goes on to become later on a big narrator of Hadith. And incidentally, Imam al Bukhari, who is also he's one of the biggest, uh, arguably the greatest Imam of, of Hadith, the greatest Hadith scholar in Islam, he was also an orphan from a very young age. His father passed away. His mother had to look after him on her own. And there are others as well, such as Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. His mother also looked after him on her own. So Abu Huraira, his mother had to take care of him single-handedly from uh, a young age. And there's a story that when he became Muslim, he went to uh, call his mother to Islam as well. And his mother, his mother refused. And she kept on refusing until one day he tried so hard that she, he said, uh, she said something against the Prophet She said something bad against the Prophet So the uh, Abu Huraira became very upset. And he ran to the Prophet crying. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, make dua that Allah guides my mother. So the Prophet made dua. Oh Allah, guide the mother of Abu Huraira. And when Abu Huraira returned, lo and behold, his mother had accepted Islam. So now Abu Huraira, he was, as I said, from the Ahl Sufa. Uh, so they basically, they were in Medina, but they were very poor. They, they, they tried to work, but there was limited work available as well. So some, not everyone uh, could find work. Um, so they didn't have their own houses, or, and they didn't have their own, uh, they weren't married, or, and they didn't have any children. So what happened is, they would live in the masjid. So, uh, can everyone see that? Yeah, so, uh, so they, would, they would live, there was one part of the masjid which was sheltered um, and they would live over there and the Prophet said, uh, so they would live over there. So now realize, the masjid back when the Prophet said and built it, it wasn't what it looks like today. There weren't any minarets or, or domes or anything. Um, it, it, was quite, it was quite simple. And I mean, you know, we all like uh, grand mosques, but, but of course, when the, prophet, the, the, the first mosque, the original mosque of Prophet it was quite simple. Um, so they would stay, they would stay in the sheltered part, and they became known as the guests of the Prophet because the Prophet he would take care of them himself, um, and other people as well. If, if they, whenever they had any extra food or anything, they would send it to the Abu Sufa, uh, who were very poor people. Uh, now we have to point out here that if somebody is capable of working then it's not allowed for them to sit back and relax and expect someone else to, to look after them and to provide for them. Um, and there's a story that once uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he passed by some people, some young men who were lying around in the masjid doing nothing. And he said to them, you know, what are you doing? And they said, we are the mutawakkilun. We put our trust in Allah and Allah is going to give us something. So what did Umar do? Umar went and got his stick and started beating them. And he said, you can't lie here doing nothing and expect Allah to rain gold and silver on you. You have to get up and work. So in the case of the Ahl Sufa, it was not like that. Some of them were, they, they were all trying to work, but it was just, there was limited work. And some of them were actually making money, but even then it wasn't enough to, to live off. So they lived in the masjid. And because they were living in the masjid, it was a great opportunity for them as well. They became known for their knowledge. They, they learned, uh, they got to hear from the Prophet what other people were not here. So they became very knowledgeable people. Um, and Abu Huraira was basically, no, Abu Huraira was in a sense known as the unofficial leader of the Anu Sufa. And there's an interesting story with, uh, with Abu Huraira. Uh, once he became, he was, you know, he was, he was learning the whole day, he, he couldn't find any food, so he became so hungry that he went and waited on the side of the road hoping somebody would pass by and uh, invite him home to eat. So what happened is Abu Bakr passed by and Abu Huraira, stopped, Abu Huraira stopped him and said to him and he asked him to explain a verse of the Quran. He took a verse and he said, can you tell me the meaning of this verse? And Abu Huraira says, I was fully aware of the meaning of the verse but I only asked him in the hope that he would then invite me home for dinner. So what Abu Bakr did, Abu Bakr explained the verse to him and Abu Bakr passed on. Abu Bakr, uh, walk, uh, Abu Bakr walked away. Then Umar passed by, exact same thing happens, Umar walks on as well. Then the Prophet ﷺ passed by him. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he asked him the, a similar question. And the Prophet looked at him and smiled. And the Prophet said, Ya Abu Hill, come with me. 
Um, so, Abu, oh, oh, by the way, just so we understand what uh, what his name actually was. Uh, so we know him as Abu Huraira. Does anyone know what Abu Huraira actually means? Well, I guess somebody knows. Yes. Uh, is Huraira the cat? So like yes, you're right. Yeah. So Abu Huraira basically means the father of the kitten. So there's one narration that uh, before he became Muslim, his name was Abdul Shams, which means slave of the sun, which is of course not appropriate. So when he became Muslim, his name was changed to Abdul Rahman. But Abu Huraira, he was quite often seen with a kitten. He would often play with his kitten and he would be seen with it often. So he became, people began to call him Abu Huraira, which means father of the Abu Hir or Abu Huraira. Hir basically means kitten and Huraira might be like a smaller version of the kitten, like a smaller kitten. So uh, we know him as Abu Huraira or Abu, Abu Hir. Um, so the father of the kitten, because he was always playing with his kitten. So the Prophet said, come with me. So he went with the Prophet to his house, and the Prophet seeks permission to enter, and the Prophet asked, is there any food available? And now his wife replies, we have absolutely nothing, except this small bowl of milk. And then the Prophet asked, where did it come from? And she said, one of your Ansari neighbors gifted it to you. So now imagine you know, uh, think, now think, uh, think about ourselves now. Imagine one of us goes home, and we look in the cupboards, we look in all the cupboards, we look in the fridge, we look everywhere, and we don't find anything at all to eat, except one small bowl of milk. And even that is not actually expected to be there. It just so happened that somebody gave it as a gift. I mean, for us, that's, that's unimaginable, right? But this is, this is the way the Prophet said, used to live. So anyway, so Abu Huraira, he sees the bowl of milk, and he's thinking, okay, finally, you know, after all this time, now I'm going to get to at least have something. And then what happens? The Prophet says to him, Oh Abu Huraira, go and call the people of the Sufa. So Abu Huraira is thinking like, oh, like basically he, he thought, you know, he was hungry for he was hungry for all this time. And he's the one who was waiting, uh, waiting for somebody to come. The Prophet then invites him. But then when the bowl of the milk comes out, he's expected to go and call all the other people. So Abu Huraira really didn't want to do this. He said he he, he had no he, he just wanted to drink it himself. But then he said, the Prophet was telling me to do something. So if the Prophet tells me to do something, I don't have any option but to do it. So Abu Huraira went and called all the people of the Ahlul Sufa. Oh, all the Ahlul Sufa. And they come, to, they come to the house of the Prophet. And Abu Huraira might still be, you know, he might still be optimistic and think, okay, well, I'm going to drink the bowl of milk first. At least I might get, I might get to have it first and then them. Then the Prophet says to him, Oh, Abu Huraira, take the bowl of milk and serve all of these people. So now Abu Huraira is thinking, like, oh, come on. And he's looking at this small bowl of milk. He's got one small bowl of milk here. And it said, they say uh, in one narration there were 70 of them. Now 70 here could just be a figure of speech, but uh, 70 is the number given. 70 of the Ahlul Sufa, they're all there in the house of the Prophet. And there's this one small bowl of milk. So Abu Huraira didn't want to do it, but again he says the Prophet's telling me to do it, so I had to do it. So he took the bowl of milk, gives it to the first person. The first person drinking and drinking. Abu Huraira is watching him, you know, nervously. <laughs> and he drinks to his fill. And then he goes to the second person, and then the third person, until he reaches the 70th person. Then he drinks to his fill as well. Then the Prophet says, okay, Abu Huraira, is it just me and you now? And Abu Huraira said, yes, it's just the two of us. So the Prophet said to him, you drink. Abu Huraira said, no, you drink, O Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet said, no. And the Prophet insisted, you drink, O Abu Huraira. So Abu Huraira took the bowl of milk and he drank, and he put it down. The Prophet said, drink some more. So Abu Huraira drank some more, then he put it down. The Prophet said, no, drink some more. So Abu Huraira, he drank some more. Yeah. Then he puts it down. The Prophet says, keep drinking. <laughs> Abu Huraira said, by Allah, by the one who has sent you with the truth, O Messenger of Allah, I don't have space to drink anymore. So the Prophet said, smiled and he, he drank the rest of the bowl of milk. And we can see here, you know, the barakah. If, if, you know, if Allah puts barakah, I mean, this of course is a miracle which, the, which Allah gave to the Prophet Sallallahu But even, uh, even for us as well, if Allah puts barakah in something, that thing will be will suffice for, for much more. And this could be in our time or our food or our money or anything. So we ask Allah that you know Allah puts Baraka in all of those things for us. And there's another narration, similar, uh, there's another similar story to this, which comes from the Battle of uh, Khandaq. And it comes from Jabir ibn Abdullah. So during the Battle of Khandaq, can everyone see that? Uh, so so the Muslims were under attack from uh, there was an army from all over Arabia coming to attack Medina. So the Muslims had to set about preparing their defenses. So this is Medina over here in the middle. Um, and 
south of Medina, there was farmland. There was farmland and you know lots of palm trees and stuff, so they couldn't march in with an army from that side. And on the east and the west, uh, there were two rocky plains or rocky tracks of you know, rocky mountains. So you can't take an army in from the east or the west either. So the only side which is vulnerable to attack is the north. So the Muslims dug the trench. The guy from Ziz is calling you. Yusuf, can you take this? No? Daddy! Yusuf. I don't know, man. He's, he's just such a mess. Oh, wait. Okay. I'm trying to help you. Alright, just going back. Uh, okay, so, so the only side which is vulnerable to attack is, uh, is, is the north. So, uh, the Muslims dug the trench over there. And we don't know the exact, the exact dimensions, but there's some estimates here. It's, they say, uh, and they seem to be reasonable estimates, someone's done their research. They say uh, 3 kilometers in length, and 4 meters across, and 3 meters deep. So, I mean, that's... I mean, you can imagine how, how, how big that would be. I mean, personally, I think, you know, it's hard enough to dig a small hole in my garden. But I, I can't imagine how they would dig such a big thing. And in such a, such a short space of time as well. So, and on top of that, it was a drought season. So there was a, there was a big shortage of food. So all the people were very hungry and tired. And one of the companions, Jabir, he noticed this. And he, not, he noticed uh, that the, uh, the Prophet himself was very hungry. So he went home and to check if there was anything that they could give the Prophet. So he found there was one small lamb and some flour. So he slaughtered the lamb and his wife started cooking the meat and, and making bread. And he went to the Prophet and he said to him, we have enough food for uh, you know, a few people, so if you and some of your companions can come. So maybe five people or something like that. So what happens, the Prophet stands up and declares to the whole army, maybe a thousand people or something like that, Jabir has prepared food for you, come to his house to eat. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and then he says to Jabir, uh, don't take the pot off the stove, wait till I come. So Jabir goes back home, quite embarrassed now, because he's going to have 1,000 people killing up outside his house. Uh, then the Prophet comes, the Prophet himself, he takes the pot with the meat in it, and he starts serving the, the meat onto the bread, and all 1,000 people, around 1,000 people, every single one of them ate to their fill and there was more afterwards. So another miracle, a similar, a similar miracle which Allah gave the Prophet But again, it's, if there's Barakah in something, then uh, it would be more beneficial. Okay, the next story we have is, uh, is Abu Huraira. Uh, once, uh, once the Muslims gathered some, some charity, they had some charity which they had gathered. Um, and in those, in those days, of course, when, when you have a large amount of money, I mean, you can't go and deposit it in a HSBC bank account or something like that. You need to store it somewhere. So, uh, the Prophet asked, who will, who will take care of this, 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 uh, this money for us? So, Abu Huraira volunteered. Now, um, as a general rule, rule, actually, when it comes to money matters and things like this, we should be a bit careful uh, you know, not, not, to, not to unnecessarily put ourselves in that situation. Because when it comes to money, that's when, you know, that's when someone, especially money which is not yours, that's when your character will really be tested. And it's, uh, it can be a fitna for anybody. Uh, and Umar ibn Khattab, he actually said, once there was a man uh, who was in a case and he wanted to bring a witness for himself. So he said, this man will be my witness. And Umar said, have you, have you had financial transactions with him? Have you dealt with him uh, with money? And uh, the man said no. So Ramadan said then you don't know him. Because Ramadan said, you know, when someone's real character will come out when it comes to money matters. And actually we know in the story of um, Salman al Sari also, there was, the, there was one of the big priests, he was in, in charge of collecting charity. He was one who was supposed to be collecting charity. When he passed away, Salman al Sari he discovered loads and loads and loads of wealth stored away in his cellars. And what happened is this man, he was supposed to be collecting charity, 
But it became too much of a temptation for him, so he ended up keeping it all for himself. And you know, money, money, it can be a fitna for anybody. This is why, um, you know, it's, it, when it comes to when it comes to things like this, that's when someone's someone's real character will, will come out, um, and that's when that's that's when uh, people will be tested, basically. So generally speaking, it's best not to best not to kind of do the uh, best not to put yourself in such a position. But you know, sometimes it might be an exception. So if there's nobody else, so in this case, you know, nobody else wanted to do it. Abu Hurairah he volunteered himself, and uh, as it turned out, he didn't he didn't um, he didn't betray the trust in the process and he fulfilled the trust. So what happened is Abu Hurairah he's sitting there with the with the money, and he's watching the money very carefully. And somebody comes and starts digging around in the money, trying to, you know, as if he's going about to take something. So Abu Hurairah gets up and catches him. And he says, you know, are you, are you stealing the, the charity of the Muslims? I'm going to take you to the Prophet So the man says, no, you know, I've got, uh, I've got no, I'm really poor, I've got family to look after, I'm, I've got this and that, I've got uh, so many expenses to cover. So, uh, let me go. So Abu Hurairah said, you promise that you will not come back? And the man said, yes, I promise. So Abu Hurairah lets him go. Then what happens? The man, the next um, after Fajr, Abu Hurairah meets the Prophet and the Prophet says, uh, "What happened to your? What happened to the man who you met last night?" And Abu Hurairah said, "He promised he will not come back, so I let him go." So the Prophet said, "He lied to you. He's going to come back." So the next night, Abu Hurairah is sitting there watching. The same chap turns up again. And he's messing around with the money. And Abu Hurairah catches him, and he says, "Now this is the second time. Uh, and you promised you're not going to come back. Now I'm, I'm going to take you to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." And the man started making it even more excuses. He said, "Oh, you know, I've got this problem and that problem, and uh, I really needed some money. And now I promise, I'm never ever going to come back again. Never ever." So Abu Hurairah let him go again. And he meets the Prophet later on, and the Prophet says, "What happened to your, the, that man last night?" And Abu Hurairah said, "He promised he's not going to come back." So. I let him go. And the Prophet said, he lied to you, he's going to come back again. So the following night, Abu Hurairah is sitting there again, watching the money, and this same guy turns up again, and he's there, messing around with the money. So Abu Hurairah grabs him and he says, come on, you promised now you're not going to come back again, and now here you are again. And the man said, oh, I'm poor, and this and that, and Abu Hurairah said, no, I'm, I'm taking you to the Prophet said, now. So the man says, okay, um, uh, now he, he realizes he's not going to let me go. So then what he said is, Shall I not teach you something? I will, if you let, he said, let me make a deal with you. I will teach you something which Allah will benefit you through. So Abu Hurairah is thinking, okay. And now, I mean, it's, now the thief here is, is teaching the Sahabi some, some, some beneficial words. It's quite uh, ironic, really. But anyway, Abu Hurairah thought, okay, fine. So, so he, he says to Abu Hurairah, when you go to sleep, recite Ayatul Kursi. Allah la ilaha illa muhayyul qayyum. Recite Ayatul Kursi. And Allah will appoint a guardian over you until you wake up. So Abu Hurairah thought, okay, and he let him go. And in the morning, the Prophet sees him again and he says, what happened to that same guy last night? Abu Hurairah said, he promised that he'll teach me something beneficial, so I let him go. Um, and what, the Prophet said, okay, what did he tell you? And Abu Hurairah said, he said to say, la ila, uh, he said to say, Allahu la ilaha illa wal in, in, the, uh, in the night, before you go to sleep. So the Prophet said, he was truthful, but in reality he's an absolute liar. And then the Prophet said, Do you know, do you know who your companion has been for the past three nights? Abu Hurairah said, Who was it? And the Prophet said, That was the Shaytan. So Shaytan came in the, in the form of the man. Um, and, yeah. Okay, so when it comes to Abu Hurairah, more than anything else, Abu Hurairah is known for narrating hadith. Um, so that uh, Abu Hurairah is known above all for narrating hadith. So that brings us to the question, what actually is a hadith? Oh, so a hadith is basically... Okay, no, actually. So, uh, so Abu Hurairah, the Prophet actually made dua for his memory as well. The Prophet made special du'as for him for this as well. He was uh, he was very keen to learn, and once there was this there was this uh, there's this narration that once um, Abu Hurairah he was with uh, uh, Zayd ibn Thabit and one other person. The three of them were in the mosque and they were praying to praying to Allah and making du'a and so on. And then the Prophet came in, 
So they all stopped. So the Prophet said, no, carry on. So they all, made, they, so they all carried on making their dua. So Zayd and the other person, they asked Allah for something. And the Prophet said, Ameen. And then Abu Huraira asked Allah, Oh Allah, give me what they asked for and give me knowledge which will not be forgotten. And the Prophet said, Ameen. So then the other two, they said, Oh Messenger of Allah, we also ask Allah for knowledge which will not be forgotten. And the Prophet said, He's beaten you to it. Uh, there's another narration that um, Abu Huraira, you, if you, Abu Huraira would memorize all his hadith, he memorized everything. There's another narration that Abu Huraira once, uh, he went to the Prophet and said, you know, I'm memorizing all these hadith, but sometimes I forget some of them. So the Prophet made du'a for his memory, a special du'a for Abu Huraira's memory. And Abu Huraira says, after that, I never forgot one single hadith. I, I remembered absolutely everything. As I mentioned, we already, we already saw Abu Huraira's attitude towards learning knowledge. Um, there's, another, there's another narration that once Abu Hurairah went to the market and he saw all the people buying and selling and he said to them, the inheritance of the Prophet is being distributed in the mosque now. What do you know, uh, the don't you know that the inheritance of the Prophet is being distributed? So all the people, they ran to get some of this inheritance. And then they came back to him and said, we went to the mosque but we didn't find anything there except people uh, remembering Allah, um, praying, learning hadith and so on. And Abu Hurairah said, don't you know that that is the inheritance of the Prophet? That is what the Prophet will leave behind, knowledge. So this is how keen Abu Hurairah was to learn. Um, and we actually know from his, he had a schedule as well. Abu Hurairah says that he divided his night up into three. So he would remember, he would uh, revise his hadith for one third of the night. I mean, I've got a picture of a book there, but everything was in his memory. It was all in his memory, I memorized everything. He would revise his hadith for one third, sleep for one third, and pray for one third of the night. So Abu Huraira, he wasn't even do, he wasn't doing things randomly either. He actually planned everything out properly, and he would know what he's doing every single night. So now with all this, uh, so um, so with all this in mind, actually, so I just need to say what a hadith actually is. So a hadith, literally, it means a a report of something. Literally, a hadith is a report of something. But in Islam, normally, it means a narration of a sunnah. So what's a sunnah? A sunnah is something which the Prophet ﷺ did, said, or approved of. Okay, so now with all this in mind, one might wonder how many hadith Abu Hurairah actually did manage to narrate. So here is the list. You can see there, Abu Hurairah is way ahead of everyone else. Uh, he spent the least time with the Prophet, but he's, he's far ahead. Um, and actually, you might look at you might look at that list and think, okay, what, why is how come Ibn Masrud at the top has narrated so few hadith? Um, and to understand this, uh, we need to go to another narration where the Prophet says, uh, "Man kathaba alayya malam, uh, man kathaba alayya mutaamidan, aw man yaqul alayya malam aqul, fal yatabawa ma qaadahu min al nar." Whoever whoever says I said something which I didn't say, he should prepare his face in health. So. We might think, okay, why is that so serious? If you say something, if you say the prophet, if you say the prophet said something which you didn't say, why is that so bad? So the point here is, if something is a sunnah, if some, if people are taught that something is a sunnah, if people are taught that something is a sunnah, then they would expect to get reward for doing it, right? And then, it, and then conversely, they might expect to, if it's possible, they might get, they might be sinful for rejecting it. Um, and the, you know the, the religion is entirely entirely built on the on the Quran and the Sunnah. So when it comes to when it comes to this, uh, that's so that's why this is such a big such a big uh, such a big problem. So Ibn Mas'ud, who I showed at the top there, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud, he basically so that's not to say now that isn't to say Abu Hurairah was making things up. No, Abu Hurairah he would only narrate things when he was sure. He knew what it was. But in the case of Ibn Mas'ud at the top there, he, he, will, he had a slightly different interpretation of this. And he, even when he was sure of something, he would be very careful not to, he would be very careful and cautious to narrate stuff from the Prophet because he feared that, you know, maybe I might uh, have a slip of the tongue, I might absentmindedly forget something, um, you know, something else might come in. So even when he knew it, he would still be careful to narrate, he would, he would still be careful not to narrate it. And there's a, there's a story, once Ibn Mas'ud is narrating the Prophet, and he said the words, the Prophet said. And then he started sweating. 
and he became very uneasy, and he just stopped. So this was Ibn Masrur. This was the way Ibn Masrur looked at this, uh, looked at looked at that narration. That which is why, or well, one reason why he's narrated much less. Um, and now there's something. So in our times, of course, when it comes to Sunnah, people are very, you know, people are people are much more. I mean, if Ibn Masrur, even when he knows something is a hadith, he's still careful not to narrate it because he thinks he might have a slip of the tongue or something. Whereas now, you know, people of people, you know, often pass things on even without verifying. And sometimes, you know, we have all kinds of invented sunnahs as well. For example, uh, people, I mean, once I heard somebody say, the Prophet ﷺ would always, every single time he would eat, he would wash his hands thoroughly, and he would put the mat down, and then he would start eating. So now, does this, does this sound, I mean, in, in, the, in the desert, does this sound realistic? That every single time the Prophet eats, he's going to wash his hands, and, and you know, put the mat down. There's no, there's no such sunnah. But people say this, and now this is a good. This is, there's nothing wrong with washing, washing one's hands. We all wash we all wash our hands before we eat, and that's the argument people make as well. They say, "Well, it's a good thing. This washing your hands is a good thing." So I'm going to say the prophet said it because it's not. There's nothing wrong with washing your hands. So I'm going to say the prophet said it, and we have to realize here that there's, you know, sunnah is fact, not philosophy or something like that. It's not for someone like me to come along and say. Yeah, I think this is good, I'm going to put it in. Oh, this is not so good, I'm taking it out. This is good, I'm... It's not like that. Every sunnah must go back to the Prophet And of course, if, if you have that attitude, I mean, you know, you never know where people could go. I mean, somebody could come and say, uh, you know, the Prophet Muhammad said, um, uh, you know, don't overexpose yourself to the sun because you be is carcinogenic. And they could say, well, that's a good thing. So there's not, there's nothing wrong with, 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 with saying the Prophet said that. But, of course, they'd be laughed at because Everything that is a sunnah must go back to the Prophet whether, it's, whether we think it's good or not. It's just what the Prophet said, he said, and what he didn't say, he didn't say. Um, and now, again, as I said, uh, Ibn Mas'ud, he had a slightly different... Um, so there's another point here. Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud and Abu Huraira, they had slightly different interpretations of this narration. And that's another point. We should realize that the Sahaba, they would, they would differ on many things. They would have differences of opinion on certain things, but they would still keep the unity. And there's another story that once, uh, during the Hajj, um, so when, when the Prophet, when, uh, during the Hajj, when in the Caliphate, during, when Muhammad was a Caliph, he decided to pray four rak'ahs for Luhur in the Hajj. So when the Prophet prayed that, he actually shortened it. He shortened it to two. Uthman had his own reasons for deciding he's, he's actually going to pray for. He had, he had some reasoning for that. Ibn Mas'ud, he said, no, how can you pray for? You have to pray too, like, the, like what the Prophet did. And they were disagreeing over this. And then what happened is, um, you know, Uthman disagreed with Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud fully disagreed with Uthman. But then when, it came to, when the time came to pray, to actually pray that Muhammad prayer, Ibn Mas'ud was standing in the front row behind Uthman. And the people came to him and said, you know, you disagreed with him, and now you're, you're, but yet you're praying behind him. And Ibn Mas'ud said, it's one thing for me to disagree with him, it's another thing for me to break away from the congregation. Okay, fast forward to 2020 now. If I, if, I, if I disagree with the Imam, what am I going to do? I'm going to start fundraising to go and build my own mosque, where everyone in the, you know, agrees with my opinion and follows my opinion nobody disagrees with me in anything at all. So we should realize that that's not the way the Sahaba works. The Sahaba would always keep the unity no matter what happened. And in our times, you know, people disagree over even the smallest things, you know. Um, and sometimes, it's so small that even if, even if someone's mistaken, they may not be sinful for it. Or it might be even, even less significant, such that in the first place, there were, two ways, there were two possible ways of doing it. You could do it this way, you could do it this way. But then what happens? One person decides I'm going to do it this way, the other person decides I'm going to do it this way, and then they kill each other. So the Sahaba would always keep the unity. Okay, so... So, now the question comes, how could Abu Huraira have narrated so many hadith? Um, and many people actually did ask that. So there's a story that Aisha herself, radiallahu anha, she said to him, Oh Abu Huraira, you're narrating so many hadith from the Prophet. So the the so what happened is 
uh, Abu Hurairah to paraphrase, he basically said to her, you were the wife of the Prophet and you had your own duties and, and stuff to do. As for me, I was on my own and I had nothing and all I would, all I would do was learn hadith from the Prophet She said, perhaps that may be the case. So in other words, she's acknowledging that, okay, maybe it is possible you've narrated so many hadith. There's another story that Marwan ibn al-Hakam, he became the ruler much later on, after Abu Bakr, after Umar, after all of them. Many years later, someone called Marwan ibn al-Hakam, he became the ruler. And he also looked at Abu, Hur Abu Huraira. And he said, you know, this man, he's narrating so many hadith. So he decided to set Abu Huraira an exam. So Marwan, he had Abu Huraira sit down and he put his scribe behind the curtain and he asked Abu Huraira a list of questions related to hadith. So Abu Huraira narrated the list of hadith to him and his scribe behind the curtain is writing every single thing down. Then much later on, when this was all forgotten, he calls Abu Huraira back again and as if he didn't remember, he asked him those exact same questions. So Abu Huraira narrates to him a list of hadith. And the guy behind the curtain, he's there with what he wrote down the previous time and he's looking at it to write down what Abu Huraira says this time. But, he, but he's looking at it and Abu Huraira is saying exactly the same things. You know, it's exactly the same hadith, he's saying exactly the same things, he doesn't change a single word. So when Marwan found this out, he thought, okay, well, if his memory is that accurate, then he must be right, he can't be making things up. And there's another story of Ibn Umar, who was, as I said, he was the second uh, highest narrator. Ibn Umar, he, Abu Huraira narrated a hadith where he said there's a special reward for attending the, the Janazah prayer. Ibn Umar hadn't heard this, so he said no, there's no such hadith and Abu Huraira was making a mistake. So Abu Huraira, he went to Aisha and he said to her, I ask you by Allah, did the Prophet say there's a special reward for the Janazah prayer? And Aisha said, yes he did. So when, when Ibn Umar heard this, he said, Okay, perhaps that may be the case because Abu Huraira, he was with the Prophet more than us and he would hear from the Prophet what we did not hear and he would learn what we did not learn. So Ibn Umar also backs up Abu Huraira. Um, and there's another story from someone called Talha ibn Abaydullah. He was another of the early companions. Somebody came to him and he said to him, You are barely narrating any hadith at all. But this Yemeni chap over here, he is narrating so many hadith. Now when he says Yemeni, he means, because Abu Huraira, remember, he wasn't from Makkah or Medina, he was from Al-Baha, which is narrated to Yemen. So he said, this guy over here, who barely spent any time with the Prophet at all, he's narrating so many hadith, while you are barely narrating anything, and you spent all 23 years with the Prophet, and, and more than that. And uh, so he said, is this really possible, or is he just making things up? So Talha, he said, we were people of houses and we had our own occupations but as for him he was a poor man and he would stick to the Prophet he would be with the Prophet and he would, he would, he would hear from him what we would not hear and he would uh, memorize what we would not memorize so Talha again backs him up and Abu Hurairah himself he actually once said because people became so suspicious of him he said the people are saying that Abu Hurairah has narrated too many hadith and then he said, but my brothers from the Muhajiru, the ones who came from elsewhere, uh, who weren't originally from Medina, they migrated to Medina, they will be busy with their business in the marketplaces. And my brothers from the Ansar, the ones who actually lived in Medina, they will be busy with their agriculture. But as for me, I was a poor man and I would stick with the Prophet and be satisfied with small amounts of food and I would attend what they would not attend and I would memorize what, what they would not memorize. So Abu Hurairah again, he's, he's showing how um, it was actually possible. A, a lot of um, well, skepticism of, of Abu Hurairah from many people, but uh, he responded to this and other people also backed him up. Now Abu Hurairah, in terms of his own family, he only married, um, as I said, after, after the death of the Prophet he only married after his death, and there's, uh, he had he had uh, he had some he had a few children as well. And there's a very nice narration. Uh, so do you remember how I said that Abu Huraira for one third of his night he would pray? Um, there's a nice narration which says that Abu Huraira would pray for one third of the night, his wife would pray for another third of the night, and his daughter would pray for the other third of the night. So in the house of in the house of Abu Huraira, 
the whole night someone's up praying. And you know, the, the importance of, of the night prayer uh, should not be underestimated. And uh, if you look at all of the, all of the righteous predecessors, the, the one thing which is, or one of the things which is common between all of them is they would all regularly get up during the night and pray. And the thing is, when it's in the middle of the night, there's nobody else there. It's just you and Allah. There's nobody, uh, everyone else is fast asleep and you are there and you are praying to Allah. Um, and you know, many, uh, any, any person, however rich they are, they will hate it when you ask them something. They will hate it when you ask them for stuff because however rich someone is, if you keep on asking, they won't be able to give you. But with Allah, Allah loves it when people ask, when people ask Him. Um, and you know, we should, uh, this is one thing which we should, we should all try and do and which all of, the, all of uh, the companions, they would all do. Get up during the night, nobody else is there, everyone else is fast asleep. Get up and pray to Allah and you know, ask Him for, and ask him for whatever we want. Um, and you know, Allah, Allah will be happy when, when we ask Him. And so yeah, it's, it's something which we should, um, we, should, we, should try, we should try and make it a point to at least once in a while, pray during the night. So yeah, uh, in the time of in the time of in the time of Umar, when Umar was the caliph, Umar decided he wanted to appoint Abu Huraira as the governor of Bahrain. Now Abu Huraira did, himself did not want to do this. He didn't want to become a governor of anywhere. But Umar insisted. Umar said, "No, you go and become the governor of there." So Abu Huraira became the governor in Bahrain. Now it came to Umar's attention that Abu Huraira had 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 Abu Huraira had. 10,000 dirhams. And you know, I don't know, he was such a, he was such a poor man before, and how's he got 10,000 dirhams? So Umar became very concerned about this. And Umar, he was very strict both on himself and on all the people who would work for him. And he didn't want anyone to become rich just uh, by virtue of them being in, in a position of authority. I mean, now if you look at, if you look at, if you look around now, most politicians, they will, leave, they will leave politics richer than they were when they became a politician. But really, that's not the way that things should be. And Umar, he was very, very strict about this. So, he, he temporarily um, uh, suspended Abu Huraira from the post and he called him to Medina and he asked him, where did you get this money from? Abu Huraira said, I made it from my own business transactions. And Umar decided, okay, I'm going to verify this. So he went and had it, he investigated and it turned out that it actually was Abu Huraira's own money which he made through his own business, not through um, bribery or lobbying or anything like that. So it was Abu Huraira's own money. So Umar said, okay, that's fine. You go back and be the governor. But Abu Huraira said no. He said no, that's, that's it. I'm not going to be governor anymore. I didn't want to be governor when you appointed me in the first place. And now I definitely don't want to be governor. So Abu Huraira, he decided he's going to remain in Medina. And he remained in Medina and narrated the hadith in the mosque of the Prophet for another 30 years. 30 years he was there narrating from the Prophet And this really, this shows, this, is, this shows us another reason why Abu Huraira has narrated so many. Because if we look at someone like Abu Bakr for example, Abu Bakr he was with the Prophet his whole life. Uh, but he's barely narrated anything. So Abu Bakr maybe during the lifetime of the Prophet itself, he might have narrated a few hadith. Then afterwards, he lives for only two years. Only two years, he's barely going to have a chance to narrate anything in that time. And on top of that, in those two years, he's the caliph. So Abu Huraira would have, Abu Bakr would have had time to narrate hadith. We look at someone like Abu Huraira, he didn't spend his whole, he didn't, he didn't accompany the Prophet for his whole life, barely four years at the end. But in those four years, he spent so much time learning. And on top of that now, he has 30 years to pass it on, which is why he's narrated so many hadith. And in those 30 years, Abu Huraira narrated to, uh, so he had 800 people that are taking hadith from him. 800 people. So those are supposed to be all their names over there. So 800 people just uh, narrated only just from Abu Huraira over 30 years. So you can imagine how he's narrated that many hadith. It's, it, it's quite, um, if, you look at it, if you think about it that way, there's nothing really surprising that Abu Huraira has narrated that many hadith, although he came so late. Um, so, as I mentioned, I mentioned the mother of Abu Huraira before. So, there's another narration here with regards to his mother. He said that Abu Huraira, 
uh, whenever he would leave his house, he would say to his mother, May Allah have mercy on you, because you took care of me when I was younger. And Abu Huraira's mother would reply, And may Allah have mercy on you, because you have fulfilled my rights when I am older. And uh, this would happen when he'd leave the house, and when he'd come back, when he'd return to the house, he'd say the same thing, and his mother would give the same reply. And this kept on going every day until his mother passed away. And Abu Huraira actually, when he first became Muslim, he said to the Prophet uh, and when his mother became Muslim, make dua that Allah makes me and my mother beloved to all the Muslims. And the Prophet made that dua. And it's interesting, you see that Abu Huraira, as I said, he came so late. He came, he only, he only, turned, he only came on the scene maybe in the, maybe four years before the Prophet passed away. And if we look at some of the companions who accompanied the Prophet for his whole life, and some of those who were there right in the beginning, most Muslims would actually, with some of them, most Muslims would actually have heard, wouldn't even have heard of them. For example, if I say, Utsba uh, ibn Ghazwan, not that many people would have heard of him. I, I, I don't think many people would have heard of him. But he was actually one of the first ten people to become Muslim. Uh, but then we look at someone like Abu Huraira, he comes right at the end, four years before the Prophet passes away. But almost every Muslim has heard of Abu Huraira's name. Which is interesting. And Abu Huraira became such a big Imam that he is the one who led the janaza of Aisha radiallahu anha. When Aisha passed away, Abu Huraira was the one who was leading her janaza prayer. And the following year, when Umm Salama passed away, Umm Salama, when she passed away, the following year, Abu Huraira led her janaza prayer as well. Now a few years later, Abu Huraira himself became very ill. So Marwan ibn al-Hakam, that same Marwan who gave him, an, gave him an exam before, he came to visit him and he said, you know, may Allah make you better. Abu Huraira said, Allahumma inni uhibbu liqa'aka fa ahibba liqa'i. Oh Allah, I would love to meet you, so I ask you that you would love to meet me as well. And this is, this is, a, this, this, this is similar to a narration of Prophet and then Abu Huraira passed away at the age of around 78 years old. Um, so that pretty much brings us to the end of the uh, story of Abu Huraira. There are just a few quick things which I want to uh, take from that. Okay, so the first one is, yeah, as I've said before, Allah guides whomever he wills. So Uthay ibn Amr, he was with the Daos tribe and he thought, you know, there's no way any of these people are going to be guided. But then, and he even asked, uh, make dua that Allah destroys them. But then the Prophet made dua that Allah guides them, and Allah did guide them. And similar with Abu Huraira's mother, Abu Huraira became very upset. She said something against the Prophet but then Allah guided her as well. And you know, in our time, we should never write people off. You know, there might be somebody we think, oh, this person is so evil, but we don't know. Allah, Allah might, be, uh, Allah might choose to guide them. So we should never think, oh, this person not got a chance. They're, they're so bad and, and you know stuff like that. It's always possible that, that Allah will guide them. And also, um, if we think about it, you know, whenever we, whenever we ourselves do something, after we pray, for example, after we fast, after we do anything in the obedience of Allah, we should say, Alhamdulillah, ladi hadana hada, wa ma kunna nihtadiya laula nihtan Allah. Or praise be to Allah who has guided us to do this. Um, and we would never have sought guidance if Allah had not guided us. And I mean, uh, you know, sometimes we even look at, sometimes we might look at, you know, prayer and stuff like this as, as, as uh, we might take it for granted or even look at it as a burden. But really, uh, another way to think about it is, I mean, take prayer for example. If you look at people who, how many, if you look at all the people who pray five times a day, I mean, if you look around the world, maybe, Maybe one in every 20, 30, 40 people might be praying five times a day. So anybody who is one of those people should be, you know, should be very grateful for this blessing. Allah has, Allah has guided them. Uh, second thing is, okay, yes, sacrifices. So nothing comes for free. Everything has its has its price, and it's the same being a Muslim. You know, if someone is, if someone wants to practice Islam. There will be certain, certain sacrifices which they will have to make, but um, of course they will be rewarded for that. And more specifically, if someone is seeking knowledge, I mean, now even if you look at, uh, say, someone doing the uh, GCSEs or A levels or whatever, uh, and if they want to get, I don't know, the, what do you call it, if they want to get the A star or the 9 or something like that or whatever, 
they would have to make certain sacrifices. They would have to work for it and make and give up certain things. But then, uh, for those sacrifices, they might get the grade that they want to get. And in same in Islam, someone who's seeking knowledge, is not, they can't expect it to be easy. There would be many different things which they would have to overcome. They would have to give up time, they would have to give... We, we look at Abu Hayyah, you know, there is actually another narration. I mentioned Abu Hayyah also from the Ahl Sufa. There's another narration which says he actually did have his own house, but he voluntarily decided to be with the Ahl Sufa so that he could spend more time with the Prophet and learn more from the Prophet. And as he said himself, he would satisfy himself with small amounts of food. You know, other people, they would be busy making money. He himself, he would satisfy himself with small amounts of food so that he could spend all that time with the Prophet And also, as I said, he didn't, he didn't have family, he didn't get married and have children until after the Prophet passed away. So all these sacrifices, you know, people would have to make. And also, I mean, sometimes it might, it might be easy to think, oh, you know, what's the point? It's a waste. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's not worth it. But as Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَّةً Allah does not forget. Allah will be taking note of each and everything, the big and the small, and and uh, you know, and the person who, who seeks who seeks the path of knowledge, there will be an, there will be unimaginable reward waiting for them. Uh, third point, yes, avoid overeating. Uh, and you know where, where, where I took that from? As as um, as I said, how how many um, uh, how the Prophet ﷺ himself used to live, and the Prophet himself once said, the worst container to fill is one stomach. And he also said, um, he also said, oh and if somebody does want to eat a lot, they should, uh, keep, they should only fill one third of their stomach, one third for water, and one third for air. And Muhammad himself actually said, um, he said to the people, oh people, avoid overeating because it makes you lazy in your salah and it's not, uh, and it's not healthy for you. Um, and you know, um, overeating can affect somebody both physically and, and mentally as well. So yeah, everyone remember that later on when you don't have too much pizza. Here's the hint. Yes. Okay. Plan your uh, yes. So make a plan. Uh, we, you know, uh, as I said with Abu Huraira, he had his own schedule that every night he's going to do. He, every night he would know how much. How, he would know. Okay, he's going to revise these hadith. And he's going to, uh, um, for one third of the night, he's going to pray and one third he's going to sleep. So, uh, and as they say in English, you know, if, uh, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And all the most successful people, they are the ones who plan things in advance, rather than going into them with no plan at all and doing things randomly. So that's another thing we should, um, we can take from this. We should make our, we should have a proper plan in advance. Okay. Okay, um, anything which we, anything, any particular skills we have, they are all a blessing from Allah. So we see how Abu Huraira, he memorized all these hadith. And we know the Prophet made so many du'as for Abu Huraira's memory. That, oh Allah, you know, give him a good, uh, make his memory stronger. And it's very clear to us that Allah, Allah answered these du'as and blessed Abu Huraira with a very strong memory. So we ourselves, if we have any special skills or anything which anything um, you know any talents or anything we should realize it's something which is Allah is the one who has given it to us you know it's very easy sometimes to to, uh, to feel like oh you know I'm the one who's uh, I'm the one who's acquired these skills and it's all my own doing but in reality Allah is the one who Allah is the one who, who gives people uh, uh, whatever he pleases okay now there's a, this is actually a, a believer is not mentioned from the same one twice. There is actually a, a this is actually a hadith. Um, in the battle of Badr, there was this man who came and he, he fought against the Muslims and he was captured. Um, and he said to the Prophet, uh, you know, I can't pay the ransom, I can't afford to pay the ransom, just let me go. So the Prophet said, okay, we'll let you go on the condition that you promise never to, to never ever ever come back and fight against us. Never ever. So the man said, okay, I'm not going to fight against you ever again. Then the battle of Uhud comes, and, and uh, this man allowed himself to be convinced, and in spite of promising the Prophet never to come back again, he basically got a contract with the Prophet, he's not going to fight the Muslims ever again. He comes and fights at Uhud again, against the Muslims. And uh, as we know, Uhud was, you know, Uhud was on paper, at least it was a defeat, and many Muslims were, many, many Muslims were killed. But believe it or not, the Muslims actually took one prisoner of war 
in the battle of Uhud. And guess who it was? This, the same guy. The same guy, the Muslims captured him. And now he goes to the Prophet and says, Oh, I'm, I'm poor and I'm this and I'm that, I can't afford any ransom or anything, just let me go for free. And the Prophet said, A believer is not bitten from the same hole twice. This man lied to us before, now he's coming with exactly the same lie and wants to say he's not going to turn up again. So the Prophet, the prophet ordered that he be killed. And we have to understand here there is a fine line between, between being merciful and being gullible. So if somebody allows themselves to be deceived all the time, it would be to their, to their disadvantage. Um, and this man, you know, as, as, as I showed, the next one was the Battle of Khandaq, which was such a tense situation. So the last thing they need is this guy, he, he comes to Badr, then he lies, he turns up, he, he promises not to fight, he lies, he turns up at Uhud again, now again he says I'm not going to come back, now what if he comes back at Khandaq again, and making it, you know, increasing the numbers further. So, the Prophet uh, didn't, uh, wasn't deceived by him again. Uh, in the case of Abu Huraira, we can say maybe he wasn't bitten from the same hole thrice because uh, the shaitan came to him once and he, he let him go, then he came to him again, he let him go. The third time he said, no, I'm not going to let you go. But in the end, the shaitan, you know, uh, he made like a, mashallah, a nice deal with Abu Huraira. He taught him something, he taught him uh, to say ayat to kursi every night and Abu Huraira let him go. So us as well, you know, in this day and age, people say all kinds of things. Um, and we should, we should, you know, we should be careful. If, if somebody is known to be deceptive, then however many promises they give you, you should be careful. Not you, you shouldn't just take what they say. I mean, they might promise and promise and promise, but we should always, we should always be careful. Uh, oh yeah, the final thing was about the sunnah. So as I said, you know, people, uh, it's uh, it's sad, but you know, sometimes people don't really. Uh, quite understand how 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 uh, how important a sunnah is, and people sometimes say things which aren't actually sunnah, and they will they will without. It. So we should be careful to verify stuff before passing it on. Somebody says this is a hadith, make sure it's a hadith. Don't just go and say yeah, this is a hadith, and you know the prophet said this. Um, and actually, it's not just common people like us who uh, who who might who might uh, make mistakes. In fact. The, the scholars of Hadith have been actually over time, as, as, my, as my teacher says, over time, the scholars of Hadith, the ones who specialize in Hadith, over time there have been many men, many male scholars of Hadith who have fabricated the Hadith. Uh, but actually, as, as he said, in the whole history of Islam, there's never been one single female scholar of Hadith who's, who's fabricated something, um, which, is, which is interesting. Um, actually, the story is, there's a story that once two big scholars, so they're not any, they're not any, you know, any random person. Two big scholars of hadith, they lived in the same city, and they had both uh, narrated thousands of hadith. And uh, then they started competing, because they both narrated thousands of hadith, but they were the exact same hadith. So, they, they narrated the exact same number. So then they started competing to see who's going to get one more, and who's going to beat the other one, in terms of the number. So one of them, he was looking everywhere to find another hadith, but he couldn't find it. Maybe because they were from the same city, so they, they learned the same hadith, so they narrated the exact same one. He was looking everywhere to find another hadith, he couldn't find any more hadith. Then he heard that the other person had come with another hadith, so he, so he beat him, so he became a bit upset. But the people came to him and said, no, don't worry. He didn't actually get another hadith, he just fabricated one in order that he beat you. Uh, so now the thing here really is, you know, having, that's, that's why when it comes to having a lot of knowledge, when it comes to learning stuff, the main thing is that it should actually people should actually act upon it. And you know, these people these people knew uh, thousands or tens of thousands of hadith, and yet this person was willing to fabricate one just so that he could beat the other guy. So uh, when it comes to knowledge, really, the main thing is it should actually it should actually change somebody as a person. It should actually have an effect on them. You know, they should uh, they should be acting upon the knowledge, acting upon their knowledge, and not just taking in information. Um, and you know, if somebody might have a small amount of knowledge, but they actually act upon it, and there might be somebody else that has loads and loads and loads of knowledge, but, it, but they still have a very bad character and it hasn't done anything to them as a person. So that first person would probably be better off on the Day of Judgment than the, than the other one, even if he, he knows less. Um, and that pretty much brings us to the end of it. Questions? Anybody have any questions, quickly? Nobody have any questions?
Okay. Um, Do you know any other, other any other companion of the the companion of the the poor Yes. Do you know any other companion? Uh, yeah, it said that um, the one that comes to mind now is Zayd ibn al-Khattab. He's the brother of Umar ibn al-Khattab. He also migrated from Mecca to Medina and he became part of the Ahlul Sufa. That's the one I can think of now. I, I, I'll look it up, inshallah, if I find someone. The Ahlul Sufa. The Ahlul Sufa. Oh, yes, you're right, yeah. Might be right. Okay, so no other questions? In that case, um, it's quiz time. Yay! So now everyone, everyone, everyone read the rules very carefully. <laughs> 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 Okay, so just, just have a look at the rules quickly. So, <laughs> right, everyone, everyone, just read the rules quickly. Brothers versus sisters. And for the prize, we've got this, we've got this cake here, which I made. And mashallah, it doesn't, it doesn't look too bad, even if I say so myself. Confirm <laughs> 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 it doesn't taste too bad either. Yeah, that's me. Okay. Um, all right. So you may only answer if your hand is up and you've been selected to answer, yeah? Um, uh, yeah, only after I ask a question. Nobody else can speak while someone else is answering. Okay, so this time, so obviously last time, um, I think that the sisters absolutely smashed the brothers. We got twice as many points as them. Uh, of course, we can't have that happening again, so this time we've changed the system. So, uh, last time it was just, it was just random. Uh, anyone can put their hands up. Now we're having uh, turns. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, we'll go one for the brothers and one for the sisters. Sorry? There won't be a fair amount, because you're giving them one point, then you give us one point. Then who will the cake be for? Me. <laughs> Okay, um, all right, so, so as I said, so as I said, there'll be, there'll be 60 second round. If you don't answer your question, um, if you don't answer your question, then 60 seconds is too, too much. I think too much? Yeah, I think it's 10 seconds. No, no, not 10 seconds. 15. Can't read from notes. <laughs> okay, sorry? Um, okay, so... What's going to happen to the It's too complicated. Alright, so... Um, the, so, so basically, in each round, so say for example, if the round has one mark, the sisters will be asked a one mark question and the brothers will be asked a one mark question. And then, um, uh, so, so if, if, you don't get, if you don't get the answer within 60 seconds, and by... That, 15 seconds. No, no. 60 seconds. If, you don't get the, if, you don't, if nobody gets, nobody, the thing is, someone might put their hand up and then uh, they answer and then at least somebody else will get a chance afterwards. 
Otherwise, it's 15, it's just one person. So, 60 seconds. Um, if nobody's, and that's 60 seconds to put your hand up, not 60 seconds to answer. So, if, say if someone puts their hand up in the 59th second, second, then obviously they will, obviously 60 seconds will pass before they answer, but they'll still get to, uh, get to answer the question. Right, like they put their hand up before 60 seconds is up. Okay? Um, what was I going to say? So the most you can get, if the, if the round has one mark, the most you can get will be two marks because if, if, the, if, say for example, if the sisters don't get their answer, then the brothers will have 30 seconds to get their question, to get the sisters' question, and then they'll have 60 seconds to get their own question. So you'll get a maximum of, of yeah, whatever. So I mean, it saves over there, you can, you can read that off. So the first question is, actually, who should we start with? Us, 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 well, actually, they say ladies first, don't they? Yeah! Oh, yeah. Alright, sit back. <laughs> okay. I can't Back draw. Okay, um... Alright, first question. Question number one. Let's start the timer. Alright, how many... This is for sisters. How many people did Abu Hayyan have to serve before getting the milk himself? Yep. One. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, with that. Brothers, there's one mark for this again. How many people narrated hadith from Abu Huraira? Yep. Very good. 50 seconds. 50 seconds. That was at least a two-month You just say 800. What's that? If we get to the point, they just have to Okay. They have an easy one. Um, all right, as you can see, I mean, you can see how many marks there are anyway. So it says over there, uh, points available for the question in this round. So in this round, now there'll be two. So that means both their question and your question will have two marks. Um, okay, this is the sister's question now. How was Medina? <laughs> right. uh, you, know what I, you know what I said? I'm sure, did you read the rules? The rules said if anyone else talked. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, um, okay. Sorry? Yeah, uh, I haven't asked a question yet. <laughs> okay. How was, how was the city of Medina protected from all four sides during the battle of the trench? Yeah, Maria? The west and the east, there were mountains. Yeah. And on the south, there was farmland. Yeah. And then only the Yeah, very good. Yay! <laughs> Sorry, boy. Okay. <laughs> Alright. Um, right, this is the brother's question. How would Abu Huraira split his nights up? Yeah? Um, he would, uh, a third would be he would pray, a yeah. third he would. Revise Hadith. Yes. And the third he would sleep. Very good. Okay, I'm ready. I'm going to get up. Okay. Um, Alright, so as you can see, for this round, there's just one mark. Okay. Um, Okay, what did uh, what did the Prophet Sallallahu say when Prophet ibn Amr asked him to ask Allah to, to destroy the people of the Dawus? Yeah? 
Yeah. Yay! Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, you didn't see the questions before, did you? They went to know. Um, okay, this is the brother's question. What makes praying in the night, specifically in the night, so special? Yes. Yep. Between you and Allah, nobody else is watching. Yes, exactly. Yay, Abu Hurairah make, which the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ameen to. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 you not even looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, what what do you What Lord did you say? Yes. Our knowledge will not be thwarted. Very good. Vincent, did you Good morning, boy. Okay, so there's two for the sisters. Yep. Okay. Okay, so the brother's question is, who will be who will be the most happy with the most happy person with the intercession or who will be the happiest with the intercession of Allah on the day of judgment? Oh sorry not. With the intercession of the Prophet on the Day of Judgment. Who will be the happiest with the intercession of the Prophet on the Day of Judgment? Yeah? No. Yeah? What if there's witnesses then? Then they'll have some sin. Please, please, that's not proper. Why do you say, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah, only from Kaaj? Right, so Uncle Shabazz here just, just, just said something without, without putting his hand up. So. Yes! Yes! No, no, no! So he, so, so he just gave part of the answer and you completed it for him. That's very good, but you didn't put your hand up. So, what, so what, what did I say happens if... Like a vegan. No, no, no. Yeah, vegan boy. In the brothers versus sisters, not brother versus sister. When they answer, one person answers. When you answer, you say something, and then you say something, and then you say something, and then you say something. You know what? You know what? You know what I did? You know what I did right on the thing? I wrote that in. Uh, what I wrote on the thing was that if anyone speaks without putting their hand up, they will have marks deducted. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right, you can only get one well, you at the very least you only get one mark for that. So sisters have a one mark lead. Don't worry, it won't last for long. I have I have confidence in you guys. I thought you were winning. Sorry? They're being toasted. They're cheating. Sorry? Are we cheating? Are we cheating? Okay. Oh, this is a very easy question. Maybe I should just give a more discount on because... Well, okay, okay, okay. The question is, did the Prophet reject what, what the Shaytan taught Abu Huraira? Yeah? No, yeah. Um, no, I, I didn't say it would get harder. I said the question's too easy, so I should ask something more difficult. Well, you should ask what Shaytan said. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, next time you do the quiz. 
<laughs> that means you can eat the cake as well. <laughs> okay, um, the question for the brothers is uh, where was the Daos tribe located initially? Who's putting their hand up? Someone has to put their hand up. Don't do that again, okay? Yep? It's in Daos and Daos in Dar and Baha, but it's actually in one tribe. Don't put their hand up. Okay, sure. Yeah. Alright, no, uh, no, he didn't put his hand up. Put his hand up. Sorry? That means the bonus point. Yeah, two, two points. I wish I wish we had bonus points. Sometimes you have to be creative and just on the spot you could say there is a bonus point. Yes. Yeah. But that's that's But that's 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 when people will start saying our lives. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Okay, sure. We'll talk about this later. Alright, this is a slightly more tricky question for the sisters. And it's got two marks for it as well. Okay, um, so this the two mark question. Uh, why, can you explain why Ibn Mas'ud didn't narrate that many hadith relatively? <laughs> yeah, Because unless he was very, very, very sure, Okay, and what else? There's a specific hadith which I. There's a specific hadith which I. I'm very popular today, I must say. Maria, come on. We're all silent. It's the same person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Maria, what, what, what are you saying? Okay, yeah. The hadith was saying to me that I never said to his place in hell. Yes, very good. Maria, Maria put their hand up, said one point, then somebody else put their hand up and said the other point. I'm like over here. So one person put their hand up and then other people complete the question for you. So different same thing with bias. We are just creative. And then then just don't go. Come on, this guy needs to give up. Wow. Okay. How many marks? Uh, two marks, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what is the hadith um, relating to eating which mentions, uh, which, which divides things up into one third? So can you tell me that hadith? Oh, that's so easy. That's so easy. Yeah. One third for water and one third for water. Very good. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, but it's not like I'm giving them a minute, I need 20 seconds. I'm giving everyone the same time. I'll do this quiz next time. Alright, this is for the trick? Yeah. Okay, this is for the sisters again. Uh, why is why is fabricating a sunnah such a big problem? <laughs> well, what makes it what makes it so serious? Timers. Oh no no timers. Right. Yeah yeah. Is it not because of the same reason as like um? No, 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 no,
If somebody makes up a sunnah, then people who hear it will think that that they will get rewarded for, for following that and and conversely they may be sinful for, for rejecting it. But no, but I, I think that there are other things because the Prophet specifically said who their narrators sunnah and biyah for me he, he Yeah, whoever says something. <coughs> Anyway, that was quite a vague question. So, so anything, anything which was, anything which was worthy of a mark, I was going to give it. Half a mark. No, 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 no. Brothers, brothers don't look very happy. I must say. <laughs> okay. All right. This is okay. Uh, what made? Okay. The brother's question is. What made Abu Huraira resign from the governorship of Bahrain? Bahrain. What What was the event which he Yep. Because he acquired like 10,000 dirhams worth from his own money, and Hazrat uh, Umar he is questioned about that, and he yeah. he don't know. Who he yeah. Thanks. No. <laughs> okay. Um. What is he saying? Yusuf, the, 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 Z's, the Z's boss is calling me again, I don't know why. Just answer it, man. Okay, prior to something. Hello? I think you come later, but we want to meet Hello? You know what? He, try, he tries calling me five times. I finally pick it up. No, but I think he said it was the second is just good. He didn't get contact, it was the problem with the visas. You put a waiting for the visas. Yusuf, you can't actually find out what's going on. They may be there outside. Did you get the pizza, you sir? They're going now. They've gone upstairs. Who's gone upstairs? You sir. Let's go up there. Oh, okay, fine. Can I suggest something? Could you swap the questions for the last one? Okay. So, uh, where are we now, anyway? So, um. Okay, so you got the final three questions. Okay. So, so do you mean I asked you first? No, just one more. I saw the question wrapped. Yeah, yeah, sure. What? You. Let's keep going. You wouldn't even know anyway because I haven't, I haven't got the questions written on the board. Okay. So, um, the sister's question is. Okay. What were the what were the Muhajirun and Ansar uh, busy doing while Abu Hayyah was learning all his hadith? What gave him an adva advantage over them? Yeah. Muhajirun were busy in the market, and the Ansar were busy in the farm. In the farm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's not just Mariam. I have Yusuf sitting here. He's not answered anything. So. Okay. The brother's question is. Um. Okay. Which two people did Abu Huraira pray janaza over? Which two people he led their janaza prayers? Yeah. And, um, yeah. 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 What? Who comes closest to Abu Huraira in terms of the number of hadith they've narrated? Oh my god. Oh. Yeah, Maria? Abdullah. Who? Abdullah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay, um, well, did they get that one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. If we were to 
Alright, the question for the brothers is Who decided to set Abu Huraira an exam? Yeah? Yeah. between Abu Huraira and some of the big Imams of Islam. <laughs> yeah? They were orphans and their songs raised them. Yeah, very good. Yeah. 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 Why didn't you ask anyone else? Whoever puts their hand up first. That's because that's with her laptop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, fine, the final question for the brothers um, is Did Abu Huraira marry during the life of the Prophet? No. Oh, no. no. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Three, get a point. Okay, so. to the sisters. Yeah. It's okay because I've already tried the cake myself so they can have it now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well done everyone. Uh, so the sisters, apparently the sisters are very generous people and they're going to share. Yeah, we're generous. 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 We're